Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we'd like to get started, if we could. I um, want to welcome you all to today's seminar, NIJ's Research for Real World Seminar Series. Uh, my name is John Lobb, and I'm the director of the National Institute of Justice. I want to thank you all for taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. Uh, today's presentation, as you could see, um, has catchy title, unusual title. Uh, Don't Jump the Shark, Understanding Deterrence and Legitimacy in the Architecture of Law Enforcement. And uh, I think that uh, it shows that um, titles are important, titles matter, so I appreciate the care that went into this one. Um, and I'm eager to learn what it actually means. So I am pleased to welcome Professor Tracy Mears to, uh, as the speaker today. Uh, Tracy is going to be talking about how social uh, psychology and legal theories intertwine to give us new insight on law conformity. She will also describe her own action-oriented research in urban police departments and how she's integrated social psychology with deterrence and violence reduction strategies. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Professor Tracy Mears is Deputy Dean and the Walton Hale Hamilton Professor of Yale, professor of Yale at law, Yale Law School. Uh, she received her PS, uh, BS degree in general engineering from the University of Illinois, my alma mater, and her JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Upon graduation, uh, Professor Mears clerked for Judge Harlington Wood, Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She then served as an honors program trial attorney in the antitrust division in the United States Department of Justice before joining the University of Chicago law faculty in 1994. Uh, Tracy and I were talking uh, about when I first met her, and it was right around that time. Uh, I feel I know her through connections that I have with Professor Robert Sampson and Professor Jeffrey Fagan, so she came um, validated, so to speak, uh, in my life. Uh, Tracy has been at Yale since uh, 2000. In uh, 2007, thank you. Uh, and her research and teaching interests center on criminal procedure and criminal law policy with particular emphasis on the empirical investigation of these subjects. Uh, she has an impressive CV and has published extensively. And I will say it's one of the persons that I like to read because I feel I always learn something. And with that, I'd like you to welcome Professor Tracy Mears. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm not sure which one of these microphones are on. I've got two. And at some point, I'm going to step away from the podium. So hopefully, either one of them will be working or you'll just be able to hear me anyway. Um, OK, uh, I'm a law professor, and we teach Socratically. So the first thing I'm going to do is ask a question and see if anybody volunteers an answer. And that question is, who watched Happy Days when they were kids? Come on, get those hands up. Okay, so anybody who watched Happy Days knows what Don't Jump the Shark is, right? <laughs> this phrase, um, and if you don't, I'm about to tell you, um, this phrase refers to the waning years uh, of Happy Days when in, in an attempt to get people to watch the show, um, the producers of the show came up with this crazy idea that they were going to have Fonz um, jump a shark. Um, and, and this amazing sort of feat. And that was going to draw viewers to the show. Well, it didn't work, right? And so um, th there are two reasons for using this title. That's one of them. What I mean to do by saying don't jump the shark is to invoke this idea that um, when, uh, when the time is gone for a good idea, it's time to let it go. And the suggestion that I want to offer here is that um, an emphasis on deterrence in law enforcement has had a good run, but it's time to let it go. And in its place, I want to suggest that ideas of legitimacy and procedural justice are the, the theoretical constructs we should look to in thinking about how to shape law enforcement. And this is also the reason why I'm talking about the architecture of law enforcement, because it's not just about particular policies. It's about how people engage people who are not law enforcement, engage with people who aren't in particular interactions, in terms of policy, and also in terms of what I will call, um, at least for purposes of this talk, the built environment of law enforcement. Okay, so to begin. In order to understand legitimacy, I think one has to um, begin by thinking about what it's not. 
And what I'm going to say that it's not is lawfulness. Okay? And here's the reason why you want to start there. Police are creatures of law. That law authorizes and circumscribes and shapes police activity is actually what distinguishes them from vigilantes. Police compliance with the law is one of the most important aspects of democratic society, and the public expects police officers to enforce laws fairly according to law and rules that limit their power. Now, the very existence of these rules of law justify the claim that police are a rule-bound institution engaged in the pursuit of justice, protection of individual liberties, and importantly, battles against crime. Now this truth about police, that they are a rule-bound institution constrained by law, is so basic that it limits our ability to remedy long-standing and problematic police conduct, especially in everyday policing, and especially in contexts that are deemed to be negatively racialized. And that's what I'm going to explain today. I'm going to do it in three ways. First, um, I'm going to talk about um, police stops. I'm going to make some references to the very pervasive stops that some of you may have heard about happening in New York. Um, You're just a little bit further down uh, from New York, but I'm sure that's made the news here too. Um, I'm then going to turn to the concept of racial profiling related to this to help motivate this understanding of this distinction between deterrence on the one hand and legitimacy on the other. And then finally, in the last half of my presentation, I'm going to talk about how I've taken these ideas down to the ground to implement some violence reduction strategies in Chicago, and I'm going to show you the ways in which I think that implementing legitimacy in the architecture of your policy has really big payoff. Okay. All right, Um, so um, lawfulness is um, when we are faced with what appears to be the over-exercise of state power in the form of stops and arrests, so I'm now referring to what's happening in New York, many will argue, people who worry about this, as in the case of New York City, uh, many move to the domain of law and describe the problem as a legal one. And in doing so, what we do is we typically describe the issue in terms of constitutional law. Um, And so then what we do is we try to remedy the problem with the same set of tools that is the architecture of law and rights. Now, it may well be that a legal valence is the best way to describe what's problematic about what's going on in in New York City. Um, You know, I I don't want to make a conclusion about that here, Um, but I'm going to suggest that there's another valence that's helpful. And I'm going to show you a construct that will help you to think about it. Okay? So here we go. Lawfulness. What is it? We want police to be as lawful as possible. Right? We want them to abide by the rules that authorize their behavior. That is, if a police officer is going to arrest someone, they can't unless there's a criminal law that says that whatever conduct the person is engaged in is prohibited. Um, we expect them to conform with the regulatory uh, rules of the agency, the administrative rules. That would be the standard operating procedures, the general orders of the, of the agency. And we also expect um, police policing agencies to conform with constitutional law, right? The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, those provide minimal floors for their engagement with individuals. And if we think about it in that way, um, we could say something like, if police are as lawful as as they could possibly be, they're headed east, right? And if they're not, it's west, right? So I'm trading here on the wild, wild west is unlawful. Um, and, well, you know, you guys are on the East Coast, so I just made it that way. Yeah. East, lawful. Okay. So here we go. We've got these different kinds of, of legal constraints that I just ma- mentioned. Laws and ordinances activate behavior. Rules and regulations can activate limit conduct. Court rulings and decisions provide legal limits and usually protect individual rights. Okay. Now, um, going back to the idea of a, of a police stop, 
usually what we're thinking about there is an interaction of at least two kinds of law. The actual um, um, rules and laws that will let a police officer know that what um, conduct the person is engaged in is criminal so that that person has reasonable suspicion to believe that the person they've stopped is engaging in it. And then some set of constitutional laws are, are, are relevant. Okay? Now, it's important to understand, though, that stops can be costly even when they are lawful and constitutional, right? People don't automatically approve of a stop just because a police officer is legally entitled to make it. People typically care, and I'm going to explain this in more detail, um, much more about how they're treated by legal agents than they care about the particular outcome of the contact, that is, whether they're arrested or not. And this may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but it's not. Now, research shows that people care about being treated with dignity and respect, and when encountering p uh, police agents, they typically look for behavioral signals that allow them to assess whether the officer's decision to arrest them was made accurately and without bias. Now, in this slide, I have set these up as if they're at right angles to one another. Of course, if you think about it, that's probably not true. Um, you know, if, if I were better at making PowerPoints, maybe I'd do something like this, you know. Um, to the extent that uh, an officer's conduct is lawful, people will tend to think um, that it's um, more legitimate or not. But importantly, um, what, what you got to see is that it's easily possible for conduct to be lawful and not perceived by people to be procedurally just and therefore legitimate. So what do people care about? Here's the concept of legitimacy that I'm working on. Legitimacy, and the, this is a concept that's been developed by social psychologists, and in particular, um, my co-author and good friend Tom Tyler, um, the belief that police are trustworthy, honest, and concerned about the well-being of the people that they deal with, um, and when this is true, um, that police authority ought to be accepted. Police, people should voluntarily accept police decisions and follow police directives, and they should comply with the law and cooperate with the police. That's legitimacy. What leads to legitimacy? These two ideas, quality of decision making, if you can't read it, um, that would be the blue bar, um, and quality of treatment. The yellow bar is outcome favorability. So let me back up a little bit. Um, you might think that the way people evaluate their encounter with um, a police officer will depend on what happens to them. So, you know, I could ask you, well, if you were arrested yesterday or if you were stopped, how did you feel about that encounter? And some people who think that outcome favorability is the only thing that will matter will say, well, obviously awful. You were arrested. That was a bad outcome, right? Um, what social psychologists have shown, though, is that even when there are bad outcomes, people can feel very good about these encounters if they can be confident of the quality of decision-making and the quality of how they were treated. So what this graph is is um, some research that Tom has done in Oakland, California, showing the relative weights of whether the citizen would voluntarily accept a police decision on these basis. Now, let me say a little bit about why this matters, why procedural justice matters. If you think that um, what people care about ultimately is status, that is how people in their group, however they're going to define that group, views them on the one hand, and also how they think uh, an, an evaluator, uh, like a police officer, evaluates their group in particular, um, then you can see why these indicators might matter a lot. People are constantly looking for information about, in any particular encounter, how someone in authority thinks about them and how someone in authority thinks about their group. Um, Tom Tyler calls this the group value theory of decision making. And he says that um, if you look to quality of decision making, our um, law enforcers are people in authority giving the person that they're interacting with information about whether the decision was made fairly and neutrally 
without bias, and these are usually cues in the context of the interaction, not in terms of evaluations of outcomes over time. So I'm not talking about a distributional measure. I'm talking about signals that the person is giving you as you are interacting with them. So they care about that. And they also care about whether you're being respectful. Why? Because when that happens, I can tell, as a person who's having this interaction with a law enforcer, that they think that I'm a person who counts. And they think that people in my group are people who count. So ultimately, what matters, okay, and I'm going to say this slowly because it's a little complicated, what matters is whether I think that you, as a police officer, think that I count. Whether I think that you think I count. And this is true even if you don't, okay? Um, but uh, what matters is my perception. If those things are true, right, if you've got lawfulness on the one hand and you've got legitimacy on the other, then what you should want is to be as lawful as possible and as legitimate as possible. Where you don't want to be is in the southwest, pick your state. Where you do want to be is in the northeast, right? And then where the interesting places are in the off diagonal. So I'm going to suggest that one way to understand what's problematic about racial profiling or what people say is racial profiling is with reference to these two valences. Okay? Now, um, just to repeat quickly, perceptions of good treatment and fairness are the foundations of procedural justice. This matters a huge amount in civil society. There's years, pages, volumes of uh, research in social psychology um, uh, demonstrating this fact. And um, we can, and the research also shows that not only does this matter to people, but when it's present, they are more likely to voluntarily obey the law. Okay? Um, so this means, of course, that procedural justice can help law enforcement agencies fight crime. Now, what does deterrence have to do with this? Deterrence, of course, is a completely different concept of compliance. Right? And to get at that, you can ask the question, as Tom does in the title of his 1990 book, which was reissued in 2006, why do people obey the law? Do they obey the law? because they fear the consequences of failing to do so, that's deterrence. Or do they obey the law because they think it's the right thing to do, or because they think that law enforcers, people in positions of authority, have the right to dictate to them proper behavior, right? If you think the latter, I want to um, I, I wanna pause for a second. Notice that a belief that you are obeying the law because you think it's the right thing to do is a little bit different from obeying the law because you think that some enforcer has the right to tell you what to do, right? Because they could have the right to tell you something to do that you don't think is the right thing to do, <laughs> right? So that's the distinction there. But even to the extent that those two ideas are different, they are fundamentally different from this idea that you're obeying because you fear the consequences of failing to do so, right? The legitimacy ideas are these two ideas about obeying the law because you think it's the right thing to do because, or because you think that law enforcers have the right to dictate to you proper behavior. Deterrence is the idea that you are going to obey the law because you fear the consequences of failing to do so. And what we have done for the last 20 years or so is really invest in deterrence, and a pr deterrence of a particular kind, a deterrence that leans very heavily on formal sanctions. Now notice, deterrence doesn't have to be about that, right? It could be about informal sanctions. It could be about shame. It could be that I don't want to be an idiot because my good friend Daphne Felton Green will talk about me to other people we know from, um, from law school. That's deterrence too, right? Um, <laughs> but um, uh, what it's not is a kind of internalized voluntary compliance, which is the engine behind legitimacy. Now, why does this matter? 
It matters because deterrence is very expensive. And to see that, consider New York again. Now, New York City, one story behind the crime drop in New York City, is a very heavy investment in lots and lots of cops. There are more cops per square inch per person in New York than anywhere else. It's the largest police force in the country. Um, Chicago is second, um, but it just dwarfs Chicago in absolute numbers, but also in terms of density. Manhattan, you know, the tiny, you know, those of you who are from Chicago know, big spread out city. Right? Go to um, LA, which I think is third, and it's, you know, the density factor is just, it's not there, right? So it's, it's even hard to think about comparing these ideas. All right, so it might be that New York achieved a crime drop by investing in lots of police by basically having, you know, cops standing on every corner waiting in the ready, you know, to, to catch somebody when um, they are break the law or thinking about breaking the law. That's a way of achieving crime reduction. But if you believe that people obey just because you can threaten sanctions and you'll follow through, then for every point of crime reduction that you want to achieve, you have to put more money behind it because you believe that people aren't going to obey the law otherwise. Right? That's not what's going on with the legitimacy idea, about which I'll say more in a second. One more thought, just to help motivate this, because why not beat the horse until it's dead? If you were driving home late at night after work, after working until 2 or 3 in the morning on some project that John has given you and you are so enthusiastic about, it's late, 2, 3 in the morning, the streets are empty, there is no one around, and you come upon a red light, do you stop? And if you do, what? There's no one there. There's no cop. There's not even your grandmother who's going to jump out and say, I taught you better than that. That's not happening, right? Why are you stopping? I submit that the reason why you're stopping is because you think that the law that requires you to stop is valid, and you do it. It turns out that even crooks do it, right? Most people obey the law most of the time. And the insights that I'm trying to share with you today is to say that our law enforcement policy ought to be organized around harnessing what we know to be true rather than its opposite. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Racial profiling, I want to argue, resides in the lower right-hand quadrant of my schematic. Now, why would that be? Little cartoon for a little break, if you can't read it. I mean, this is from The New Yorker. It says, you look like this sketch of someone who's thinking about committing a crime. Okay, now, <laughs> this example is a way that many people conceptualize racial profiling. If you ask a lawyer, what is racial profiling? Most lawyers will say, well, it's conduct, it's, it's contact that a person has with um, a police officer that's illegal because it's motivated by that person's race, right? And um, the problem is that it's illegal. Here are some things you can read while I talk. Um, so this gets back to this idea that if you think that the problem is a legal one, then the way you want to remedy it is by meeting it with the architecture of rights. The answer, of course, must be to think about how one would remedy the violation of Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, so on or so forth, okay? Now, the procedural justice view is different, right? And one way to see that is to think about the incident involving Henry Louis Gates. Now, um, I should say, um, by, by way of disclaimer, there was a, a, a committee commission that the city of Cambridge engaged as a national commission to evaluate um, the, the arrest and, and make a report. Um, and I was a, a member of that commission. So, um, but this, I do have some inside knowledge, but this um, stuff that you see here comes from our report, so it's all public, right? Now, the thing to remember about this incident is that the reason why Sergeant Crowley was at Professor Gates's door 
is because a police dispatch called him there. Um, there was a report by a neighbor that someone was breaking into the house, and um, uh, Sergeant Crowley was dispatched to the house to investigate. So it wasn't as if he was roving in the neighborhood and you know, decided on his own to go to the house and investigate. After he gets there, he sees Professor Gates. Things happen. You've read about them in the news. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is what Gates said. Because if you think about what I just said, you couldn't say that the reason for their encounter was motivated by race. It had nothing to do with that. He was dispatched there by a police dispatcher on report of a crime. So if you're looking at east to west, it looks pretty east. right? But things happen uh, once they were there. And one of the things that happens is Professor Gates says he keeps asking for Sergeant Crowley's name and badge number, but um, Sergeant Crowley never responds. You know, he just sort of stands there and, and looks at him woodenly. Um, and Gates says, and I have this in bold, the silence was deafening. Then he even says to the officer, you're not responding because I'm black and you're white. And, you know, Sergeant Crowley still says nothing. Um, and um, then other things happen, as you've read about in the news, and, and Professor Gates ends up being arrested. But if you ask him if he was profiled, he'll say, um, yes, I was treated differently in the encounter. And he's not talking about the arrest. He's talking about this, that Crowley dissed him, didn't talk to him, wasn't polite, didn't ask him how he was. How, how are you doing today, sir? He didn't do that, and he was really upset by it. So this is a structure of what happens. You have a belief that um, police are being unfair, that profiling is occurring. You conclude that the police aren't legitimate, and then there's hostility, defiance, resistance, unwillingness to accept. If you go back to here, right, you'll see that often racial profiling uh, contexts where people will say at the end of the day that they were racially profiled, a lot of the times, I'm not going to say every time, a lot of the times have to do with situations where the police behavior is, is lawful under ordinary understandings of constitutional law, but not procedurally just in, situ in, in the way that I've talked about it, right? Which means that this is true, that you can never remedy, or it's very difficult to remedy, racial profiling through a legal construct. You have to remedy it by heading north, right? Not by heading east. Okay. Um, the final thing I want to say about this before I, I head to the, the second half of the, of the talk, which is my work in Chicago, is that these ideas suggest, as I said, an, an architecture of encounters, that it's possible for you to do something that's completely lawful, that's interpreted by the person that you're encountering, by you, I mean a police officer, um, in ways that you don't expect, right? So one of the things that only relying on the lawfulness dimension does is um, it means that one person is right and one person is wrong, right? If the police officer's behavior is lawful, then that means that the person that they're encountering, by definition, is wrong. Because police can only stop someone, arrest someone, when that person, when they are constitutionally authorized to engage them on the basis of their wrongful behavior, right? The value of adding the legitimacy spectrum and giving you two dimensions means that both people can be right. The police officer can be right, and the person stopped can also be right and say, the way you have treated me is not okay, despite its legality, right? Now, one more thing um, to show you how people interpret this, okay? And when you look at this picture, what do you see? Is it a happy scene? Is it a sad scene? Is it a scary scene? Calm? Threatening? Okay. What if I add a little something? I'm going to suggest that your ability to see this as calm is going to depend a lot on the background 
that you hear, right? And these ideas of legitimacy and procedural justice are often a background condition that helps people interpret what's going on. New technical difficulties here. Okay. Now, your ability to see this as calm or as dependent on no background music. But I'm giving you kind of background music now. This an architecture of sanction. It depends on law enforcement agents conveying to you that you had better obey or else. What if I change it? It could be different. be calming, could be reassuring, it could be behavior and conduct that creates attachment, right, between the public and law enforcement agents, because it's really um, ultimately what the procedural justice context is about, right, it's about cre do, engaging in conduct that allows people to rely on the benevolence future benevolence of law enforcement agents. It's about conduct that causes people um, to believe that people are being neutral and fair. Um, it's about causing people to believe that you, as a law enforcement agent, somebody who's in power, will treat them as somebody who counts as a citizen. And what it means to be a citizen is that we're all in this together, right? And we all have shared responsibility an obligation to produce a society that's safe. Okay? All right. How do you motivate this in practice? Here's what I've done in Chicago. Okay. Now, um, we uh, started in 2002 um, to deal with some violence reduction as part of Project Safe Neighborhoods, which I'm sure some of you in this room, if not all of you, have heard of. Um, and at the time, um, the administration in, in power was very much interested in gun control, gun crime reduction using a particular strategy, uh, emphasizing federal prosecution. The idea was that if you target people who had had guns in the past, um, then um, those are the people who are most likely to be involved in crime, so we should prosecute them first. Um, if they have guns and thereby persuade them not to carry guns in the future. What does that sound like? That's a classic deterrent strategy, right? More federal prosecution, more um, federal sentences, which could be deterrence, but also um, incapacitation because sentences are longer. Um, firearms policing in Chicago, getting guns off the street in Chicago. Um, every year uh, we get about 13, 12, between 12 and 13,000 guns off the street in a year and then these offender notification meetings. This is the key that I want to focus on now. When we first started talking about in Chicago, Pat Fitzgerald, who's the U.S. Attorney, said, well, I want to do the federal prosecutions um, like they did in Richmond, Project Exile. I said, okay, Pat, that sounds great, but look, um, there's no reason to think that your target population is going to know what you're doing. Why do you think that they're going to know what you're doing? He says, well, we're the feds. You know, Everybody knows what we're doing. And I was like, well, not your population. Um, they're used to going to 26 in California. Um, that's the, the, the state's attorney's office. In fact, we subsequently did a survey of about 300 um, gun offenders in Chicago and who had, which I'll show you, negative opinions of the police, pretty positive opinions of the state's attorney, absolutely no opinion of the federal prosecutors because they don't engage them. So this is not surprising. Um, so I said, look, here's what we should do. We should have forums. And this was modeled loosely after the Boston Ceasefire Project, um, where we bring them in, tell them what the federal penalties are. We could do some other things, um, at least to notify them and let the, 
make sure that they know what's going on. That would be deterrence. People should know what the penalties are um, in order to ensure that they're going to avoid them. So the, the, the little trick, though, is once we, we decided to do that, I added some, some architectural features into the, into the meeting. Okay, so here's what we did. Um, we have the forums that are one-hour meetings with active gun offenders. They were recently released um, uh, to parole and probation. They had to have a prior gun offense or a violent offense, lived in our target community, which is the high crime west side of Chicago, and they possibly had gang membership, not all of them. So the idea, as I said, was to let them know um, what the penalties are, but also let them know of what their life could look like if they turned away from crime. So we had three sets of presentations. First, the law enforcement message. You're a, a, a convicted felon. You can't have a gun. This is what's going to happen to you. Second, we had an ex-offender message. To those of you um, who grew up in the black church like I did, I like to call this the testimony part of the, of the meeting. This is the part where the ex-offender basically said, this is my life. I've changed. You can do it. I did it. And then there's a community message. Here's how you do it. These were basically service providers from these offenders' own neighborhoods who told them what services were available, drug treatment, um, GED, work training, so on and so forth. So here's some examples of what it looks like. Oh, wait, one more slide before that. Um, actually, this is the important part of it. Um, this is the architecture part, okay? Because then you're like, well, where's the legitimacy piece of this? Some of it is in the fact that there's both um, information about the sanctions, but also the information about how you can change your life. But the architecture of the room was key. So the room was not set up like this, right, where there would be speakers who come talk to people in a group. Um, in fact, it was set up in what we call the Urban League style, in a round table style. Why? Because if you are sitting down with speakers at a table, first of all, you're all on the same plane, Right? There's no hierarchy. Right now, I am standing up in front of you. You are sitting down. You are feeling forced to listen to me. Right? Um, we didn't want people to feel that way. We wanted it to be equaled. Why? Legitimacy theory says what you want to do is convey a message that you are somebody who counts in my eyes. And it's hard to do that when someone is standing up over you as opposed to when you're sitting down at the table. One. Um, second, we wanted to have mutual accountability. If I am sitting down at a table talking to you, you are looking at me, you're not sort of falling asleep in the back of the room, you can't because we're all sitting here around the table talking to one another, right? Um, third, um, because there's sort of no, theoretically, no table head, if it's really a round table, there's nobody who's in charge. It's not really the way it turned out, but that was a theory. Um, then everybody is equal in that way. And finally, we didn't have it in an official room with flags and stuff like this. Um, why? Flags are the shark music, right? You don't want any shark music. What you want are clues, cues to people that this is a place where they are valued. We had it in libraries. We had it in, um, in Chicago, as John knows well. There are a number of old, beautiful parks that are, are lovely places. We did it in Garfield Park when the Chihuly exhibit was there. It was a beautiful place that everybody would want to be in. It was a place of civic importance. The idea is that you are returning citizens. This is a place to which you have access. Join us as a new citizen, right, in this place as we co-produce safety in the community. Okay, here are some of the messages. Police commander message. I really like this one. At some point, somebody laughs, and I know why. Because they've gotten to the part that says, so if you get angry, pick up a shoe and beat someone with it. Now, why is the police commander saying this? Because this was a message about guns. It's targeted, right? Just put down your guns, stop the violence. There's no claim here that, you know, you just have to stop committing crime, right? Because if you do that, you're going to lose. I can say more about that in the question and answer period. Um, so that's one. Here's a state's attorney's um, message. Right, so you'll see they're saying, here's what's going to happen, but also being encouraging 
Um, go out, be producers, don't destroy the community. A lot of the legitimacy message is about activating agency because the idea of voluntary compliance is that you do it yourself, right? You're not going to be made to do it because I'm holding a club over your head, right? You have to decide to choose to obey the law, and it turns out that most people do. Here's the ex-offenders message. This is the second part of it. Um, I really like this one. It's very representative. Change is a choice, but accountability is a guarantee. So he's saying to the young men in the room, usually almost always young men, you have to decide to do this. The guarantee is that we're going to hold you to account if you pick up the gun. And this is why you can't say stop committing crime. That is not a guarantee that the police and the um, state attorney could follow through on. And everybody knew it, right? They're not going to get every single crime that that these guys engage in. They did feel like they could make a pretty strong guarantee that they could follow up on any gun crime because they were devoting a lot of resources to that. And the final message, of course, was the service providers who said, we've got drug treatment, we've got GED, so on and so forth. Okay, I think I've got about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to give you a little information on how we know it works. I'll go through this relatively quickly because I've written a lot about it, and if you would like citations, I'll give you the paper. Um, the two papers on which this is based, are, uh, one of them was published in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, um, and then the second paper is actually just submitted for publication. Now, um, the PSN area is the west side of Chicago. Our control area was the south side of Chicago, and then we had the rest of the city. We had a pretty fancy statistical design where we accounted for prior crime and basically to assess the, the drop in crime for um, uh, the affected areas we did, we used a design called a growth model um, where you allow each individual police beat to vary and then we also compared the variation between the police beats. The reason why it's called a growth curve model, if any of you have kids, you take your kids to be weighed and, and measured, right? So your, your kid, of course, has his own curve or her own curve and then you compare that information to all other kids who are supposed to be like your kid, but in fact, I heard it's like some sample of kids from 1950 in Colorado, whatever. Uh, anyway, um, so one, one of the things you see is that there is a pretty sharp decline in the PSN areas. You also see right, that crime was declining already in the PSN area. So in the paper, we explain that the reason why we think we had a substantial impact here is that because the slope of the line changes, right? And the, the, the decline is faster after the beginning of the program. Okay, here is the, the really big important slide. And what this shows um, are, these are effects on the quarterly neighborhood homicide rates in each one of these um, predictors. So we've got forums, gun recoveries, prosecution, sentence length, um, are a percentage decrease in the log homicide rate. So they're comparable. That's the point, right? So for each percentage increase of sentence link, which is like a person year, you get a uh, 0.8 reduction in the log homicide rate. For each federal prosecution, which that one wasn't statistically significant, by the way. Um, for each federal prosecution, you get a you know 2.7 um, reduction. For each gun, you get um, a 2.2. So a federal prosecution is roughly equal to a gun. Um, so it makes you can think about, about you know, cost accounting. Um, the gun number is actually interesting. You get 100 guns off the street. You save a life in Chicago. And the forum measure works like this. You become eligible to participate in the forum by being released from prison with a gun crime or a violent crime in your history. So that's how the pool expands. Then as you go to the forum, you come out of the pool, so the pool gets smaller and it's constantly getting bigger and being depleted, right? So this is for each percentage increase of people who are eligible to go to the forum and who in fact go. You get that. Um, we had 99% compliance rate during the testing period of people who went to the forum when asked, and they were randomly assigned. All right? That last point is going to be important for the next graph. Because people always ask, well, what about people who go to the forum? Are they different from people 
who, um, who don't go? And the answer is yes. Right? If you went to the forum, our analysis shows that you stayed out on the street. So this is the, we say recidivism up there, but we're really supposed to be saying desistance. Right? You will stay out on the street roughly 33% longer um, than people who didn't go. This one, not so happy. Right? This is you, you take um, just the gang members and see um, what kind of impacts that you get. Um, and you get a little bit. Um, the sad news is that after about 50 months, every gang member in our sample was back in prison, every single one. They all go back. The fact that you see, so that would be this little gap here, um, is that the people who were treated went back last. So the happy story, you know, for people like, I don't know if Diane Williams came, is, is here um, from Safer Foundation, but the happy story is um, it gives you a kind of treatment window for services, right? Um, you, you have a little bit more time to work with. That's the way we like to, to talk about these results. And finally, um, why this sort of view of thinking about, you know, architecture and encounters is important. Um, turns out that almost everybody thinks that you should obey the law even if it goes against what they think is right. This is the legitimacy perspective, right? I'm going to obey because I think you are legally authorized to tell me what to do. Now, the red bar, that's Tyler and Huo's study in Oakland, um, and specifically their study of young men in Oakland. So that was as close to a group of people they thought could be offenders as possible. The blue bar is the Chicago Gun Project. That's my study with Andrew. That is a, a, a sample of 300 active gun offenders, people who are on parole or probation. These are the real guys. Nobody's ever actually asked the legitimacy questions of this group of people who were real offenders um, before us. And one of the things you see is that they're basically like everybody else, right? Criminals obey the law for the same reasons that everybody else do, for the most part. But things change when you see whether the police treat them with respect, right? So Tyler and Huo, those are ordinary people. 77% of them think that police treat them with respect compared to 22% who don't. If you look at our sample of offenders, they are almost exactly opposite. And what does this mean? I think what it means is that Law enforcers are not availing themselves of the potential of legitimacy, right? As I said, deterrence works. It totally works. It's just costly, and it doesn't last very long, right? So if you can change the world so that the blue bars are more like the red bars, you're going to get cheaper law enforcement, you're going to get more compliance, and you're going to get longer lasting compliance. At least that's what I, that's the suggestion. It's my take home. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we'll open up the floor for questions, and I want to remind people since we're tape recording, if you could use the microphone and state your name and your affiliation before you ask your question. My name is Winnie Reed from NIJ. Uh, I would just like your take, Tracy, on why you think this is so much harder for gang members. Well, um, I mean, I would go back to this, right? Gang members are people who have had lots of um, contact with the police, right? And they've had lots of opportunities to um, come to the conclusion that um, police are people who um, don't tend to treat them with respect, um, are not treating them neutrally and fairly, right? And so they can't really avail themselves um, of, um, you know, the, the, the aspects of legitimacy that, you know, give you the bigger bang for the buck. And so and one way of thinking about it is maybe all you, all you end up being able to use, really, on gang members are... Um, is deterrence. One thing, though, that's fascinating, so um, we have a paper called Why Do Criminals o Obey the Law, um, which 
uh, was just um, submitted for review. And um, so this is w one of the, the graphs from that thing. But one of the things we actually find is that um, gang members run higher on some of the what I'll call professed legitimacy scales than the behavioral ones, right? So if you ask um, gang members, well, maybe not this question, but there's a legitimacy scale that we use, which this is one of them. And people who are in gangs actually score higher on those measures than, than people who don't. Um, now, you know, I'm looking around at some of you and you're kind of like, well, that's weird. But now you're thinking about it again, right? And as you think about it again, you think, oh, that's not weird at all, right? Of course it's not weird. Because these are people who are part of organizations who are used to hierarchies um, and re obeying rules. So of course they're going to be committed to these ideas, right? These ideas don't have to apply only to obeying, you know, the laws that prescribe crime, but are, are just sort of rules of, of social society. So to the extent that you are a group that cares about um, rule compliance, at least in your own group, then it's kind of not surprising, right, that, that, that they come to that conclusion. So um, I, I think that's the, um, that's, that would be my answer, Winnie. I think the problem with saying that, which is why I'm still talking, um, and not letting somebody else ask me a question is because it is, I worry that in saying that, then that's basically sanctioning the idea that, well, then we should just use deterrence, obviously, for the people who are the most hardened criminals. Um, because I want to say that there is the possi you know, that you always want to say that there's the, the possibility um, for redemption, number one, that you might be able to persuade um, them to adopt more legitimacy based bases of, of compliance over time. I mean, this was a, a really small intervention to get um, the kind of results we got. And I'm sure somebody's going to ask me that question, and I assure you I have an answer. So um, maybe you don't want to answer a ask it since you know you're not going to surprise me now. Um, <laughs> but the other thing I worry about in saying that is that you don't want to authorize sort of broad-scale deterrent strategy, because often law enforcers don't really know who the gang members are, right? So if you treat everybody as if they're a gang member using deterrence-based strategies, then you also risk alienating the people who weren't inclined um, to go that way anyway, for which legitimacy really will work, right? So that you should try that strategy first. Thank you very much. Am I calling on people? If you'd like, absolutely. Daffy. You're, you're a deputy dean. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Daphne Felton Green from the Office for Civil Rights. Um, I just had a question about people who are not the gang members who have the benefit of the forum that, that you all hosted in Chicago. And people who are in society that maybe never have encounters with police but deserve the legitimacy model. How do we get police to adopt that as a model of behavior? How does that get inculcated in the culture of police departments so that they're not looking at deterrence when you have an encounter like with Gates where what he needed at the time was a legitimate right. response and a legitimate behavior. So how do we get right. that to happen? Right. Brilliant question, indicative of University of Chicago Law School training, I say. <laughs> uh, so um, when I started this work, I actually was concerned a lot more um, with those people, right? So, you know, the idea at the beginning of this, you know, when I started teaching in 1995 was about you know, law enforcement policies, at least the way lawyers conceive of it, is all about, you know, defendants and victims. But there's sort of a third party other, you know, you could, you could say, right? And this is people in the community. And how do we think about how they are interacting? Because they have to be um, their, their partners, their audience. They're, they're really critical um, for thinking about um, the goals and projects of a community, really. Um, and so this is actually one of the reasons why um, I found Tom's theories so attractive because, um, you know, the, the question you want to ask is, well, how is it, right, that people actually internalize this idea of voluntary compliance? How is it that you decide that obeying the law is the right thing to do or that government authorities have the right to dictate to you proper behavior? So then we have to shift to developmental psychology and how children learn things and how they're taught, right? Um, this is actually how the shark music got into the the study, I was reading developmental psychology and the ways in which parents give cues to kids 
about things that are okay and things that are not. And one of the things that you find in some high crime communities, so now um, I think the best source of data on this is actually an NIJ sponsored project, the project on human development in, Ch human development in Chicago neighborhoods, PhDCN. Um, what you find is that in a lot of communities like that, um, people um, are actually um, very intolerant of, of crime, actually. Um, maybe even more so than, you know, in, you know, the sort of liberal, wealthy neighborhood that I live in, in New Haven. Um, but they're also very distrustful of police. So there's a paper that Rob Sampson and Don Bartush have written where they talk about this dichotomy as legal cynicism, right? And if, you're, if kids grow up in a context of legal cynicism, the kind of cues that they're getting about the extent to which law enforcers are to be trusted, legal structures are to be trusted, um, you know, police officers are benevolent, um, they're not getting that information, right? And so then you talk to police chiefs like my friend Frank Straub, who's now public safety director in Indianapolis, and um, he's encountering a kid who runs every time he sees the police, and, the, and he says to the kid, why are you running? And the kid says, well, because my father ran, right? That's the kind of information that they're getting generation after generation. So all this means, of course, that you're right. This way of encountering people has to happen, um, actually maybe even more important, that it works for people who aren't going to be arrested, who aren't the gang members, who actually aren't ever even um, stopped by police. And so there's the, then it's how the media treats them, what the stories are that sort of circulate in a community about how people are treated. That to me is the real danger actually of what's happening in New York, right? Where um, 18, if you look at young African American men in New York between the ages of 18 and 24, something like 85, I think this is the number that Jeff told me, 85 to 87% of them are stopped in a year, right? That's a lot of stories. <laughs> and that's going back to their mothers and their sisters, right? And so these are the people that are sort of creating a norm about you know, what police are about. And it's not a norm and a story that's supportive of this. And when I've done this kind of training um, in a couple of police departments in Oakland and Cambridge, um, you know, I've said to, to cops, look, you have to understand that every encounter that you have has an audience that's not there, <laughs> right? So even if, you know, this kid or whatever you think deserves it, you have to understand that the kid is like the Clara girl, right? And they tell someone, and she tells someone, and so on, and so on, and so on. I'm going to get every cultural reference into this talk that I possibly can get. Um, but so you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And it turns out I think that they're probably even more important, really, in, in ensuring that this works than the offenders. Yes, in the back. I'm, I'm Karen Stern. I'm with the uh, National Institute of Justice. and this. The question kind of follows along this idea um, that you mentioned about stories and the audiences that's not there. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the data that you've shown so far kind of draws a very bright white line between, um, you know, you've got the gun offenders or the gang members and then you've got those individuals who don't belong in those groups. But I'm wondering if you've got uh, data from your own research or are aware of data from other projects that looks at the variable of how many encounters an individual has with law enforcement in terms of their beliefs in legitimacy, lawfulness, procedural justice, yeah. et cetera. Um, okay, so I can think of two studies. Um, uh, but the one that's the most relevant would probably be the oh, finally, uh, would be the study that Tom and Jeff Fagan did in, um, that was published in the Ohio State uh, OSUCLJ. It's the o Ohio State University Journal of Criminal Law. Um, so um, Tom, Jeff, um, Chris Winship, Anthony Braga, and I did a kind of symposium on legitimacy that was published. In, in, that, um, in that journal. And um, what Tom and Jeff did was to look at 
a um, sample of New Yorkers where they ask them questions about, you know, their perceptions of police, these legitimacy questions, so on and so forth. Then um, they actually had encounters with police, some of them, not everybody. Um, and then they talked to them again. So it was a longitudinal uh, study, unlike uh, some of the other ones, panel, panel data. And the idea was, what they were trying to do was um, disabuse Wes Scogin of this idea that um, these legitimacy effects only run in one way. So Wes had written a paper basically saying, look, all police can do is screw it up, right? That if they are mean to people, you know, they treat them poorly, so on, it's definitely going to make people have negative opinions of the police, but there's basically nothing that they can do to rehabilitate themselves, right? So, you know, doing good, um, you know, sort of investing in the kinds of stuff that I've been talking about today isn't going to help. Um, now, Wes made this conclusion on cross-sectional data, um, so it was kind of hard for him to make that claim. But anyway, um, <laughs> Tom and Jeff showed, in fact, not true, that um, one, that, that you can do things that are consistent with in investing in um, legitimacy based routines, processes, and practices that set up a kind of reciprocity of interaction that will enhance um, procedural justice of encounters and thereby enhance legitimacy. It is true, however, not surprisingly, that negative encounters are more impactful than positive ones, right? So um, that is, you have to have a lot more positive ones <laughs> um, to overcome the effects of the negative one, which actually goes back to um, my answer to Winnie, right, that one issue with the gang members is that they've had lots and lots and lots and lots of negative encounters, right? So you got to do a lot, right, to fix it. Okay, going around the room. Yes, in the back. You have to be in the microphone. Sorry, you just made a point from an operational standpoint that is difficult, if not impossible, to deal with. You have a negative. Humans react to negative events. It's part of our basic cognitive stimuli setup. We internalize those much faster, much more rapidly. We learn from them. That's actually how we're designed. We're not designed to react to affirmative events. Ergo, you are now asking the DEA and all other law enforcement agencies to quadruple, quintuple, sextuple our activities to try to balance things out. Mm -hmm. How do we logistically manage this with manpower? Okay. Actually, I'm not. Um, and the reason why I'm not is goes to my answer to Daphne, right? Which is, um, look, you first of all, you don't want to start just sort of willy-nilly encountering people in terms of a stop context in order to balance this out. But there are all sorts of ways in which you can encounter people that don't have to do with sort of stops on the street, arrests on the street. One way of thinking about this is that it actually gives you some meat, some architecture. Right? for thinking about what you should be doing in community policing. It also, also tells you what you should be doing with your media strategy, actually. Um, you're supposed to ask the question at the microphone, but the second point is, as I said, you could have a media strategy and any institution and organization, even if it's not a community policing organization, I would hope, could have a media strategy that could explain to people in widespread terms what they're doing that are, exact, that are legitimacy enhancing. One of the things that's legitimacy enhancing actually is actually simply explaining to people what you do, right? right? So anytime you encounter somebody, you say to them, um, you know, rather than saying that Ellen gave me this wonderful example, police officer stops you after you sort of do the California roll through the stop sign, and he says to me, um, I have my kids in the car, license and registration, ma'am. And I say, why would you stop me? License and registration, ma'am. You know, how about, well, I saw you, you know, rolling through the stop. This is an area with kids. Explain yourself. People like explanations. Um, and you don't have to simply explain what you're doing in, the, in an individual context, which you could do. But you can imagine, I think, doesn't take much imagination, to uh, imagine explaining what you're doing on a broad scale and in mass terms, right? Businesses do this all the time. Yes? Uh, Tom Feucht, NIJ. Tracy, I'm glad you mentioned um, community policing because I wanted to ask you to put that in its place within this context. What 
what is it what is it where does it bear on these issues what does it f fail to bring to these issues so here's what it fails to bring um, and then I know there are some questions over here um, what it fails to bring is that it's just sort of a mindset right community policing is about enhancing trust in the community but how do you do that right for some people that's doing good doing good deeds. For some people, it's riding a bike through the neighborhood. For some people, it's, you know, a very sort of nuts and bolts, making sure I've met every single one of the people who live in my community almost as if they're a constituent. Right? The idea of procedural justice, I think, I hope, right, is that because it tells you what's important to people and how they come to conclusions about what's rightful about your behavior as a cop, right, then it's telling you something about the architecture the policy that you ought to implement in the way in which you engage people. It also tells you who you should be engaging. This goes back to Daphne's question, right? I've spent a lot of time in my presentation um, talking about research that I've done that's relevant to how it impacts people who have been um, found to be wrongdoers. But really the power of this idea has to do with people who aren't really because it's a social psychological theory. Right? So if you persuade the people who very rarely get caught up in the criminal justice system, that gives you a cushion. Right? That gives you something to rely on. Right? That's like you know, your interest, basically, in, in your bank account. You know, to use you know, yet another, uh, uh, it's like paying it forward. Right? You, in, 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 you interact with those people, then when something negative happens, you have something to rely on. They already have reason to trust in your benevolence. They already think you're fair. They already think that you think that they're someone who counts, right? So they can explain away the incident that would otherwise validate. That's what you don't want. You don't want the incident that validates, right? And in order to make it not be the incident that validates, you have to have a different way of dealing with people and actually engage with people who are not wrongdoers, and who you actually never think are going to be wrongdoers. And not just because you want them to tell you about, you know, what crime happened, right? Because you want them to tell you and be a full partner with you in the production of safety. Yes. Jury. What? They wind up being your jury. Well, that too. Yeah. Microphone, please. John says Hi, uh, Thomas App from OJP. Um, one of the things that I took away from Tom Tyler's presentation and I think I'm taking away here, but I just want to make sure I'm getting the right conclusion, is that there's, there's often been uh, a trade-off presumed between active or aggressive policing and police legitimacy and police community relationships. Is, is one of the uh, conclusions that you can draw from this work that you can do active policing, you can, uh, you can make a lot of stops and do those types of things, but if you do it in a way that is perceived to be fair and respectful and you know, the high on the treatment act index, that you can actually get the public safety benefits of that without losing the community? Yeah. That's the Northwest, okay. actually. I, and I have one <laughs> specific question, which is, um, on the PSN data with uh, on your slide that went back to the um, the calls yeah. that was you showed the much bigger effect yeah the for forms. the calls versus the guns recovered versus the yeah. prosecutions I didn't really quite understand uh, what the call-in metric was you okay. know one gun one prosecution I get that but what was the one and in one percentage increase in the um, percentage of people who were eligible to attend the forum who did, who went, right? So you have this pool and you're, basically it's looking for a saturation measure. I mean, think about it like vaccination. That's the way to think about it. That as you vaccinate more people in the pool, you're getting a bigger effect. But let me go, and I can say something else about that again, because um, I, I was too flip when I said to your answer, Oh, and you, then you can do lots of stops. I said it's the Northwest. And I'm sure somebody was paying attention and said, wait, you're saying all those stops are unlawful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so no, I'm not saying that. Um, you know, hopefully you're doing all the stops in a completely legal and constitutional way and you are also legitimate. So you're in the, um, you're in the Northeast. But, you know, just between us in the room, right, 
the implication of this is that they don't have to all be constitutional. Really, I mean, I'm just going to be honest here, right? That they don't have to be. And they might still be perceived as legitimate and that, um, that people, now, you know, we can have a normative discussion about whether this is okay, the lawyers in the room. I have this argument with my students all the time. Um, but I will tell you what people think. People prefer the public, you know, and I've got a, a research project with, with Tom on this where we have surveyed 2,000 people across the country in, in um, 15 different cities. People like the Northwest better than the Southeast. So if they had to choose, right, between a condition where police were violating the law in some way, let's say they didn't quite have reasonable suspicion for the stop, but you were really nice and respectful, so on and so forth, they prefer that than the condition where you are on all fours with the Fourth Amendment, but you treat them like a jerk. Now, again, we can talk about whether that's okay or not. I'm just telling you, that's what people like. And there's actually an example of the uh, regime that you mentioned in Milwaukee. I'd say that's pretty much what Ed Flynn does. He engages in lots of stops um, in high crime neighborhoods, um, and they have a very aggressive program of what they call sell to stop. He tells his um, guys that they need to be very unfailingly polite um, to the people that they stop. And if um, the person that they've stopped, for example, doesn't have a license, but they're not the kind of person that they're looking for. They are sent off with a warning because his idea is that people should not have to pay a tax, um, you know, a traffic tax essentially, just because they live in a high crime neighborhood. But this is an area that still needs policing. And, um, you know, by all accounts, at least that I've seen, you know, that, that strategy is, is, is working for him. Yes. Um, I'm Kevin Malone. I'm from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And um, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. It was really exciting to uh, hear a conversation about legitimacy uh, with a sociology background. I get really excited uh, yeah. when I hear that thrown around. But um, m what came to my mind uh, in your conversation was that um, the police are just one, um, one agent in um, – in, in this in the whole spectrum and that from the perspective of people who are disenfranchised and who the the police don't hold any legitimacy like the police are a part of a larger uh, one of many groups that 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 create that anti-group like discord and uh, many of those other groups um, like the people in your neighborhood and mine um, also have ideas about legitimacy and about punitive justice and about why people commit crimes. And um, many of those ideas about why criminals behave in the way that they do that you use um, like empirical evidence at the beginning to disprove, saying like people don't commit crimes because they're terrible people and like people like that your science at the beginning count, dis the, this audience is very unique in that. And there's a huge population out there that has different ideas about why criminals behave in certain ways and believe in punitive justice. And how do you feel about not just educating um, police about the empirical advantages of legitimacy informed policing, but in informing the general public from like a politically informed perspective on how legitimacy impacts uh, all these things? Sorry if that was friendly. Thank you. Um, hmm. How do I want to answer that? I mean, that could be long. Um, so I want to say that part of the reason why I shift to um, the idea of like why do criminals obey the law for the same reason of everybody else is I think this idea of always trying to detect a relatively rare event um, and design policy around it is, um, is just ultimately not fruitful and it, it leads you down this path of you know, the whole root causes thing and, and you know a bunch of stuff that, that, that's illuminating and helpful but I don't think um, necessarily gets you to, you know, policy that's, that's going to be impactful at the end of the day. So one way of answering this question is to dodge and say, you know, I actually don't want to get in a conversation about the real reasons why people break the law because my whole point is we should, be stop, we should stop talking about that. 
Uh, what we should start doing, or at least spend more time, because we haven't really, is spend time talking about all the reasons why people comply with the law, look at those concepts, see the extent to which our policies, our structures, and it's not just police, right? It's about the courts. This procedural justice stuff is being used in the courts. It's about how we operate prisons. It's about how we operate schools. This stuff goes long way, right? You know, Tom has written all books about its applicability in the corporate setting. You know, I understand that Ellen Scrivener has done a talk about this in the workplace. I mean, you can use it everywhere, right? So um, look at these concepts, see how it lines up with our policy, and see, you know, whether we need to make adjustments. You know, I spent the first five years of my career um, looking at the sort of standard, what I called get tough law enforcement strategy to see the ways in which it impacted negatively social disorganization. I shouldn't say disorganization because one of the points I made in that piece was that there's no such thing. It's only social organization and places are differently organized. But um, so the ways in which these policies impact social organization of, of, of different communities um, to their detriment, right? Um, so, you know, there's that. We know all the ways in which the kind of deterrence, get tough strategy, strategies where we're trying to figure out why people are doing the bad things that they do. Um, you know, we've really invested in that. And I, I'm really just trying to, to shift the conversation. Um, and I think what I would say to, the, to those people is just, you know, ask them, well, why do you obey? And then why do you think that <laughs> people who you say don't obey the law are, are any different from you? Or how are they different from you? Or how often are they different from you? And if it turns out that they're not really that different from you very much or very often, then why should we organize a law enforcement policy as if they are? That would be my answer. Yes, Amy. Amy Solomon, OJP. I want to know if the uh, law enforcement agencies see the power in this idea. Do you have police departments uh, beating down your door? Are they being trained? Obviously, Ed Flynn has uh, taken to this idea. Are they being evaluated, those that are taking? Um, so are they beating down my door? <laughs> Some of them, <laughs> which is why I'm never at home. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think police chiefs in big cities get this, you know, um, and, and cities where it's tough, you know, so I can tell you um, the, the people that I talk to who I'm, you know, very engaged with this are the chiefs um, of Boston, Ed Davis in, in Boston, and George Gascon in um, San Francisco, and Tony Batts in Oakland, and um, Ron Davis has not had a big jurisdiction, but it's a violent one and East Palo Alto, and Frank Straub in Indianapolis, and Ed Flynn in Milwaukee, and um, uh, people <laughs> in the Chicago Police Department, um, and Frank Limon in New Haven. I mean, there are a number of Gary McCarthy in, um, in Newark. Um, so there are a number of people who get it and see its importance and are doing things that they can uh, to try to implement it. Turns out, though, that often the places where people are most excited about it are the places where um, the political landscape is tough and the crime context is tougher, right? And so I, probably part of the reason why I spent so much time talking about how cops might relate to it is um, you know, when you're out there in the street and it's violent and it's hard, um, you know, you, you worry about your safety and that's real. And so one of the things that Tom and I have tried to do is to say that this is not inconsistent with preserving officer safety and there are particular arguments you have to make about that. You know, to say that there's a payoff for you at the end of the day, it's not just about that this is the right thing to do, which it is just the right thing to do. Let's not be not clear about that. Um, but there are instrumental benefits uh, and compliance at the end of the day. Um, you know, so it's my hope, right, that, um, that more um, policing agencies will, will take it seriously as, you know, the, the evidence mounts up that it's, it's something that matters. On that note, oh, yes. Hi. Susan Howley from the National Center for Victims of Crime. A lot of what you said resonated with me with regard to crime victims, and I wondered if you had looked specifically at police treatment of victims as adding to the legitimacy, because 
um, I could think of a few types of situations, for instance, the, the great number of rape victims who are disbelieved and treated as though they don't matter, or all of the um, homicides in high crime urban areas that go unsolved, become cold cases, and the family feels, I must not matter, no one stays in touch with me. Or all of the young black men who may be offenders one time but victims another um, may not be treated respectfully um, and with dignity when they are victims. I just wondered if you have looked at that or viewed your research through that lens. Um, I talked with Susan Herman about it um, very extensively, actually, when she was writing her book on parallel justice. And she's a friend. For those of you who don't know, Susan Herman was uh, maybe not your immediate yes. predecessor. Your immediate no, predecessor? She was Two people's, okay. Anyway, she used to be in charge of the National Center for Victims of Crime. Um, and, you know, this is obviously a, an idea that, that has relevance um, to the victim context and, again, ties back to, to Daphne's question that this is really not about achieving, you know, to the extent that somebody wanted to try this as um, a strategy for, you know, uh, reducing crime, it's a mistake to think about its applicability only to people who are offenders, right? And, and this is this point. Um, either because a person might be an offender in the next iteration or because they are members of the community that sort of have an interest in having productive um, partnerships um, with law enforcers um, and agencies, and government agencies generally, actually, that can help them as a communities achieve their goals um, and projects. As far as the rape context in particular, I actually have a student right now. Um, at Yale, there's a requirement called the substantial supervised analytic writing where a student writes uh, what one hopes to be a publishable paper under the supervision of a faculty member. I don't know if anybody here went to Yale Law School. You have to write it before you graduate. And um, her name is Yeni Hernandez, and she's actually writing a paper on procedural justice as it applies to rape victims um, for this reason. Um, I just wanted to say one little thing on what you said, though, um, where you said, well, you know, um, you know rape victims might think... Um, or no, it was a homicide. Hom the families of homicide victims might think that um, they don't count because the case was never solved, right? Now, that, of course, is a focus on outcomes, but if you said instead, well, they care, what they care about is people keeping in touch with them, just letting them know what's going on. I'm not to say that they don't care about that, but the procedural justice perspective is really more about actually not necessarily having to solve the case. Right, and, and that is what I meant. Okay. Uh, staying in touch with those families, yep. even though the case has gone right. cold, and letting them know that you know, you're still open to information and they do still matter. Right, right. Now, again, I don't want to say that I think that you know, that's what police officers should be doing instead of doing the work. I mean, that's not what this is about. It's, it's just a, a point of different perspective, change in perspective, you know, what matters. There are all kinds of things that you can do to help right, the relationship that actually doesn't have to do with that, that you can do. And actually certain things that you don't have to do. Like, you know, people don't necessarily expect that you're gonna solve the burglary case where the person took, you know, came in and took your TV, right? But, you know, what they do want is some kind of contact with you and an explanation of what you did and, you know, that you tried, right? Um, and then, you know, if it goes away, it goes uh, away. But the, the idea that you're never going to be in contact with anybody and only in contact with in the very rare cases where you've ever solved the case is just not a winning strategy. So. Uh, 